Thank you for joining us online and here in person at the California State Capitol in Sacramento. I'm Don Howard, and I have the privilege of serving as president and CEO of the James Irvine Foundation. We are a privately endowed foundation, independent of any company or family, and we focus entirely on California. Our singular goal is a California where all low-income workers have the power to advance economically. This year, we will provide $180 million in grants toward that goal. I want to thank Zocalo Public Square for hosting tonight's event and others like it around California. The events are about what makes a good job, and that's something we think a lot about at the foundation. One out of every three Californians is paid low wages. Many lack benefits, control over their schedules, and any advancement opportunities. Even worse, too many workers face unhealthy conditions on the job and are afraid to speak out for fear of retaliation. That's just not fair. And it's not the California we want or need. We need more, not fewer, equitable paths to the middle class. That's why I'm grateful we can support organizations in California that are helping low-wage workers to protect their rights and advocate for better jobs. Workers need a voice on the job, in their communities, and here at the state capitol. Nonprofits and foundations can partner with governments to help bring that voice to policymaking and to ensure equitable implementation of laws. I'm grateful Sarah's voice will be part of today's discussion. And I'm grateful for the participation and leadership from Senator DeRazzo and Assistant Chief Labor Commissioner Yu. We're excited to partner with Zocalo to present this essential conversation. I'll now turn it over to Moira Chowry from Zocalo Public Square. Thank you, Don. Hello and good evening, everyone. I'm Moira Shuri, and I'm the executive director of Zocalo Public Square, an Arizona State University media enterprise. At Zocalo, our mission is to connect people to ideas and to one another. Our content is free, and everyone is welcome. We publish original writing and present conversations like this one. We were founded in 2003, and we are now celebrating our 20th year. You can find us at ZocaloPublicSquare.org, on podcast platforms, and on YouTube. So please subscribe for our latest programs. We're excited to be here in Sacramento on the steps of the California State Capitol to continue our series, What is a Good Job Now? with the support of the James Irvine Foundation. This series focuses on workers in the low-wage sectors of California's economy in communities across the state. Through public programs and essays grounded in workers' experiences and realities, we explore how to make the hardest jobs more rewarding and make life better for those who do them. Tonight's program asks, what is a good job now for fairness in the workplace? I'm pleased to introduce our moderator and my trusted colleague, Joe Matthews. Joe is the California columnist and democracy editor at Zocalo Public Square. He was previously an Irvine Senior Fellow at the New America Foundation and a reporter at the Wall Street Journal, the Baltimore Sun, and the LA Times where his beats included labor. He is the author of books about Governor Schwarzenegger and about California's governance and constitutional failures. He is the co-founder and co-president of the Global Forum on Modern Direct Democracy, the world's leading network of scholars and practitioners of participatory democracy. His new project, Democracy Local, is a planetary platform focused on how everyday people govern themselves. Over to you, Joe. Thank you so much, Moira. Uh, thank you to Don, the whole Irvine team for all you do for California. Um, and welcome all of you, um, both here and present and for those who are watching it online, that, that large audience, uh, to the California State Capitol's West Steps. It's one of the great public gathering places of California, a place for protests where people come together and, and, and demand better rights and protections for workers and, and other Californians. Um, it's also a, a space that's very, its future is very uncertain. There may be some construction here quite soon. 
um, that could change public access. So enjoy it while you're here. Uh, again, I'm Joe Matthews, the California Columnist Democracy Editor at Zocalo. Uh, we have three uh, deeply experienced, thoughtful panelists um, who can answer the question of the night, what is a good job now, you know, particularly if you want to be treated fairly in the workplace, um, and, and, and get to three areas, the on the ground realities of working and seeking fairness in your job in California, uh, laws, how we make laws um, to make jobs better and fairer, and then the challenges of enforcing them. Um, I'll introduce our three panelists. Um, to, immediately to my left is Maria Elena DeRosso, state senator representing Central and East Los Angeles and the city of Vernon. She was the seventh of 11 children born to migrant worker parents who followed crops through California and Oregon. She graduated from St. Mary's College and the People's College of Law. She's really a giant of the labor movement in California. We know her in Los Angeles where, where Zocalo is based um, for uh, her many years of running Local 11 of Unite Here, very important union, uh, representing um, um, hotel workers now on strike. Um, and the Secretary General, that's the boss, that's the Chief, uh, the Secretary Treasurer of the LA County L uh, Federation of Labor. Just two of the leadership positions she's held. To her left is Sarah Fee, founder and leader of Inland Empire Amazon Workers United. The warehouse workers who seek to transform working conditions give voice as Don talked about, um, to those who labor inside Amazon facilities. Um, she lives in San Bernardino County, was born and raised in San Diego. Her career has taken many turns. The last two years, she worked at an Amazon center, a facility um, at the San Bernardino Airport, uh, an air hub. Um, and Daniel Yu is the assistant chief for the field enforcement and judgment enforcement units of the California Labor Commissioner's Office, which is sometimes known as also as the Division of Labor Standards Enforcement. Um, he previously served starting in 2015 in positions including senior deputy labor commissioner, deputy labor commissioner, he's conducted workplace investigations, he has a law degree from NYU. Um, I, and I, again, um, I want to thank you for joining us tonight. As we get into the, the conversation, I'd like to remind our audience that we'll be taking questions towards the end of the program. If you're watching online, you can submit um, your questions to the live chat on YouTube. Um, so let's get started. So in this conversation, you know, there are, there are kind of two big things you hear a lot about. Um, and we're here at the Capitol, and we hear a lot about how Cal the state of California is some of the nation's strongest legal protections for workers. Um, just recently, the legislature added a $25 per hour minimum wage for health workers, legislation effort led by Maria Elena. Um, $20 in new protections for fast food workers. Five guaranteed paid sick days, up from three for many workers. Um, um, you lawmakers even gave their own staff the right to organize a union. But then you go out amongst California and you see um, there's quite a bit of suffering. Um, the various forms of abuse by employers. Wage theft is an enormous problem. Unpaid overtime, dangerous working conditions, uh, discrimination in the workplace. Um, um, a lot of surveys suggest a rise in retaliation, particularly in, in recent years. So I think a big question is to sort of frame is the gap. What's the gap between our, our legislation, our intentions, the policies we put in place, and the realities on the ground? Is it closing? How big is that gap? What explains it? Um, I actually want to start by asking Sarah the first question to sort of ground us in the reality. Um, you're in California. You, what is it like to work at this big company, one of the richest companies in the world, you know, in Air Hub? Do you, what protections do you sort of feel on the job, you know, of, you know, from your state, and, and what aren't you protected from? So the, the gap is enforcement, right? And so worker power helps on the floor, but uh, having these laws give us a place where we can start from, right? When we're, when we're organizing, I know that, like, I don't have to worry about getting fired for break here in California because I know these laws. But not every worker in California knows the labor laws. Not everybody knows about AB 701. So in those workplaces where organizing is not taking place, those workers may still be susceptible to uh, the rates being an issue. What, tell us a little about the, the, the kind of work you do. You're there at the San Bernardino Airport. Um, there are planes coming in. You're, you're packing planes. You're unloading planes. What is it like? What is, you know, you know, what do you worry about? Where, 
what, what do you feel is unfair or do you feel unsafe about in that context? What's it like to work there? Um, repetitive motion. Um, there's a lot of repetitive motion and there's a lot of equipment out there that can be put in these warehouses to make the job safer and make it less hard on our bodies. And uh, my previously <laughs> previous employer did not purchase those equipment even though uh, we asked for it. So there are, th there are things that exist that lift the pallets up off the floor so you don't have to stoop down to, to grab a heavy box off the floor, you know? It will raise up and then it's more, like your body is more centered, the weight is more centered, so less likely to get an injury from that. W one last question, if something goes wrong, if you're being treated unfairly, is it clear to you in the workplace who to complain to or how to complain? Uh, no, uh, HR at uh, Amazon is there to mitigate Amazon's liability in these situations. It's not really there to help workers. So without, the, in my experience, without the help from worker centers like uh, the Warehouse Workers Resource Center, um, I wouldn't be able to take any action against Amazon like a, a ULP, which is an unfair labor practice. Is there anyone there to complain to? I mean, these often, I've been in some facilities, Amazon facilities, they're big, they've got a lot of stuff in them, quite a few machines in them, not always that many people. Is it, is it, did it mean emailing someone or calling someone just to, I mean, to for talk the, to a supervisor? For the most part, they tell you to, like if you have a complaint uh, that may be above what the supervisor is willing to deal with, they will give you a phone number where you call somebody, you go through, I don't know, 10 or 12 different prompts, and then you speak to a person, and then nothing happens there also. Oh, okay. Thank you very much. I want to bring Daniel Yu into it again. He uh, does enforcement, the assistant chief of the enforcement at uh, the California Labor Commissioner's office. Um, so, Daniel, you know, in this, the, the Maria Elena and her, and her friends, and, and are you still in this building ever? Um, there, there's some renovations. Yeah, in January. So keep coming up with some, some laws that people support, they're excited about, um, regulations, and then they come to you. What is the challenge of enforcing in this environment when there's, you know, more, you know, there's more progressive, there are rules to follow, but I mean, how do you do it? Is it, are they doing too much? Are they loading you up with too much? What is the, wh how do you see this sort of gap between legislation and reality? Right, so as Sarah mentioned, one of the key elements to ensuring that the laws get followed is effective enforcement. And how we see effective enforcement is that part of it is also about when we do an effective enforcement action, it's not only helping the immediate workers that we're trying to recover wages for, but we're also trying to let them know, hey, listen, if this happens in the future, here's what you can do about it. And we're also putting the employer on notice, you know, you got caught for this, make sure that in the future, you're complying with the laws, and we're hoping to also nudge the behavior of the employer community in the area as well. So we're hoping to make each enforcement action more than the specific action itself, which is part of what we're trying to do with both enforcement being uh, simultaneously outreach as well as education as well, while also trying to address the issue for the specific workers we encounter in the workplace. So that's kind of what we looked, that's kind of our approach to enforcement in that we recognize that there's not enough investigators to cover every single violation in California. And frankly, um, there probably won't be that in the future, just given the amount of how big California's economy is, how big California and all the employers, and how many employers there are. What we wanna do is we wanna be as effective as possible, and we want each enforcement action to basically nudge and change the behavior of multiple employers at the same time. So that's what we're trying to aim to do with enforcement actions, and that's how we aim to enforce new legislation as well and new protection for workers. Just to ask something, I, Cal Matters, the the nonprofit, big newsrooms, biggest California focused newsroom in the state, has done a lot of good work. Groupers like uh, Jean Kwong and and uh, Alejandra Reyes uh, Valerde, and and you know they did a big series in the last year that talked about um, you know there were a huge number of vacancies at the state labor commissioner's office, hundred. I mean, are you is 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 it's is it, you're never gonna get enough, or is it, it's, are you, is part of the problem the same problem that so many employers are having? You can't find enough workers with the, with the skills to, to do what you need? What is the, 
What is the shortage of people and personnel for enforcement? Where does that come from? I think the two things I can share is that one is that for the Labor Commissioner's Office, hiring our vacancies remains our top priority. We want to get as many qualified investigators to our door as possible, train them up, and have them enforce the laws of California. Um, we'll acknowledge that the qualities we're looking for is that these are not easy jobs. Let me just first acknowledge that. Oftentimes, you know, they have to be, um, they need to have multiple skill sets, including being able to diffuse, you know, potentially hostile situations, being able to be inquisitive, figure out what's really going on, make connections with the workers, build trust as well. And that's always been fundamentally one of the big uh, challenges in enforcement, which is building and getting worker trust as well. Because to us, that's almost 80% of the investigation work. Where, where do the people who do that work come from? I mean, you know, the police departments can call in the military. Where do you find people to do this work? So actually in this respect, they come from many different backgrounds. Um, we have folks who come from other state agencies who interact with the public. But really, what we're looking for is a diversity of backgrounds, right? So we have folks who are former uh, workers in the industries themselves who bring critical insight into like how the industries actually operate. We have folks from, say, the you know, nonprofit world who have worked with workers at worker centers. Um, and we have folks from more of traditional law enforcement background as well. So we have a variety of backgrounds. But fundamentally, the qualities we're looking for is that inquisitive nature, the ability to kind of delve deep into the question, build trust with the workers, and be able to be fair, but you know, conduct uh, thorough investigations. Is la is language skill a big issue? Do you even do you train people in languages? I mean, work, low wage workforce, you know, incredible diversity of languages spoken, and and co language comfort is so important for these kinds of conversations. Right. So bilingual qualities are very important to us as well. It's not a requirement for many of our jobs, but certainly if a worker, uh, if a candidate has bilingual language qualities, you know, and we're able to hire them, that's more workers that we're able to serve as well, more effectively, because, you know, it is, it helps kind of build that trust as well. It helps us cut through the communication barrier. Thank you very much, Daniel. Um, now to Senator DeRazzo. Um, I mean, a similar, the similar framing of the question. Now, you. You worked in a union, you, you fought, you organized, um, you did, I mean, unions do the work of enforcing our labor laws, you know, you're writing laws. How do you think about this gap, um, you know, between where we are in terms of the rules we have and the realities of workers and, and, and how, what should we be doing? Is there things we should be doing that we're not doing to close it? Sure. Well, welcome to the Capitol. <laughs> uh, this is where we, go in and out of hearings and meetings and votes and, uh, and uh, we all get, most of us get very excited when we're able to introduce legislation that's really gonna make a difference in people's lives. Because if it's not gonna have an impact, then why bother? Why waste everybody's time and energy and resources? Uh, that's, that's what most of us really want to do. So um, passing a law is very, very important for me, passing a law, getting it signed by the governor, as he has just signed a few of my bills, uh, when it's going to make a difference in people's lives because it will have some enforceable side to it. Um, having working people like Sarah involved and knowing that she is out there on, in, on the ground, where the, in the workplaces, that's going to make the difference between passing a law that just gets signed and puts on the shelf or really makes a difference for people. So I, have, I live, try to live by this phrase that you do the most good for the most people when you empower them to do it for themselves. And I don't care what, what we're talking about here, but that matters. So when Sarah has a backup of a law and she organizes her coworkers uh, and then they know that they have Daniel ready to come in if the employer does not respect that. That combination here is what really will make the law impactful. It will make a difference in their lives. I also know being a union organizer that when you don't have these pieces, then people go day in and day out with um, wage theft. Imagine, not that they're getting uh, less than what they need to survive, the minimum wage 
is being uh, robbed from them and their families. So to get less than $15 an hour, we had uh, average in the uh, garment industry, which led to my bill uh, of $5, an average of $5 an hour. Now, how, you can't survive on 15. How could you possibly survive on $5 an hour? So the, the legislation to bring uh, more protections to those garment workers was uh, aimed at in, in making sure that upstream liability to the brands was held accountable so that when the workers did have the courage, were ready to speak out uh, to the labor commissioner's office, then we knew that we could not run around like chickens without our heads going from this contractor to this one, to this one, to this one, but rather we go straight to the top. And this legislation would allow us to be more likely to be successful in finding them responsible. So I love this part of the work that we do in the legislature. So um, is, is when it gets to budget time, when it gets to kind of enforcement and the like, is that has that been a big conversation that we need more of it? I mean, does that does it come up? Um, it doesn't get as much publicity in media as some of the big progressive moves you're making. Um, and what is that conversation like? I mean, with with the administration, with the the Department of Finance, which is the people running the budget, the part of the Newsom administration. Does this come up a lot? And what, and what are those conversations like? The budget comes up, unfortunately, went one-sided. In other words, um, we're going to raise the wages and it's going to cost $10 million more. But we don't talk about is how it's going to save us from having to provide uh, food uh, or rental vouchers or all the other things that, as a government, we provide for Californians. That costs enormous amount of money, tens of millions and hundreds of millions of dollars. So we only look at the one side versus how much it's gonna save us. And that's what's missing most of the time from the budget. Of course we have to be mindful of our budget, but one is how do, what good is that uh, budget uh, item? What's it gonna do as a good thing for California? How much is it gonna cost? And What's it going to save us? And we don't have usually in our conversations how much is going to be saved as a result of Sarah getting paid what she should get, get, get paid. And, and that's what I think is still missing, and we have to do a better job. So um, um, the theorist Max Faber, who, who wrote on work famously, you know, I think said politics is like the slow was it, it's the it's a slow boring of boards, essentially. It happens quickly. You do things a piece at a time. Um, it's piecework. And I wonder if the if all the stuff you've done, it, if if you think the picture, whether for a worker or an employer who wants to comply, is too complex. Do all the pieces of this of this new, more progressive labor regime fit together, essentially? Are they are they easy enough to understand so that workers can do that and enforce it? And has there been conversation about about sort of putting things together, or is it just you got to take the wins you can get? It's so hard to get them, you know. I mean, you do twenty five dollars, you know, for as a new minimum wage for healthcare workers, but it's complicated. The compromise involves you know, multiple years and certain triggers that could slow things down on the path of $25. How do you think about that? Well, I think we're, if we have an honest conversation as to what's at stake here, then I think we all come up with the best possible solution. But when folks are not being honest about what, um, what's at stake, then, I, then we end up dragging and dragging this out. And unfortunately, that's not for the benefit of Californians. So when we look to raise wages, you know, what is it gonna cost? What, how does employers, but we also have to look at, look at these men and people who are working hard every day and they can't pay the rent. Let's look at the people who are pay, working hard every day and they can't pay a childcare. I mean, these are basic things. When I was a kid, a good job, you know, that I would, aspired to have meant that I could, we could pay the rent and we didn't all have to sleep in tents outside, which we did have to 
we had to do many times. You know, it meant that we had enough food on the table. It meant that we had clothes, you know, that we didn't have to wear the same clothes every day. That's what it meant. It meant that my parents, after working their entire lives, back-breaking work in the fields, picking all these crops alongside of, you know, us alongside of them, that when they reached, you know, 65, 70, 75, they didn't have to do that anymore. That's, that's what a good job, that's what we should be doing, and that's what we should be judging and evaluating in, this leg in, in any legislation that we propose. Okay. Let me um, talk to each of you about what it's like, what happens when you're treated unfairly. Here's a four-page form from Daniel. You got it off the website, printed off the website um, from the Bureau of Field Enforcement and the Labor Commissioner's Office. Um, this is report of labor law violation. It covers a lot of different violations. Um, though not wage theft, that's different, that's industrial relations. You gotta go to them for that. Um, but you know, there's, I mean, it's hard for me to read without my glasses, I'm getting old. Um, but there's a lot of information, I mean, to, to put on here and when you get to the the couple pages that talk about what your suspected violations are, section four, there's more than 50 different potential boxes to pick in categories like overtime violations, minimum wage violations, workers' comp, child labor violations, meal period violations, unpaid wages, pay stub violations, rest break, record keeping, failure to post, business expense, pay date, misclassification, licensing registration violations, where there's a whole section on warehouse distribution centers. Failure to provide lactation accommodations is on here. Um, there are things for garment manufacturing, paid sick leave violations, and then a kind of a long list of other. I mean, is this, is this, how useful is this, is this form? That's a, it's, it's a complicated form in smaller print with a lot of choices to make that we're asking people who are not experts in labor law to do. Um, I mean, I, I'm curious, Daniel, I mean, you know, what, what would you say to that kind of questioning about how we ask people to complain and how we do this? Is this so, too complicated? I will say that is a very fair criticism in that we've had a lot of internal debates over, you know, how long the forms are as well as the number of boxes that we have on there. Yeah. So first thing that I will say is that the forms themselves, we consider them a starting point, right? We don't expect workers to be able to fill them out perfectly. In fact, you know, there are, you know, as you mentioned, you know, 40, 50 different violations. We don't expect workers to be able to know all of them either. Instead, what we're looking to do is just to get some key components, like for example, who is the employer, you know, what type of violations are being alleged right now, and most importantly, who can we call to get more information about this? And that's how we look at the process. The form just gets us started but the real investigation begins once we're able to interact uh, with the individual as well. But I will acknowledge that it's a very long form. Right, and then there's the U.S. Department of Labor, which does some paid leave and stuff. You can go to them. I mean, is there a, is there a rule of thumb for people who do this for a living, like that could be conveyed to workers that sort of says, if it's this, you call this? Are there three or four things that everyone should know? Does it boil down to that kind of, you know, kind of wisdom? You know, where you go, what kind of complaint and where you go. You know, something with a rhyme, maybe, you know, that we could all remember. Yes. <laughs> so this is going to seem like a self-serving answer, but yeah. I think your first starting point is always with us. Because yeah. the state of California, like, we, we as trained professionals, like, know, like, which agency handles which issues. So if you let us know what is going on, and you don't always have to just fill the form out. You can give us a call. You can come to our office. You can tell us what's going on, and we can kind of direct you to the right uh, place as well. That being said, when it comes to you know wage theft, people not getting paid properly, generally speaking, we're the right persons to come to first. And if there's some issues that for whatever reason we can't handle, we're able to interact with other government agencies and bring them on board as well. So generally speaking, we would generally be the first point of contact. Sir, have you ever seen this form before? No, I have not. <laughs> so what is the, what, you know, how did you become educated through the organizing, right? Did, does the Amazon or, or anyone sort of, or did you, they make you read a thing on the, the, one of those posters on the wall? How do you learn about this stuff? Uh, I spent a lot of time with the workers, warehouse workers resource center and they, they did 
like they have people come in that that tell us hey like is this happening at your workplace this is something like is this an issue for you they know what the issues are and they bridge that gap in between the worker and and the agency because doing filling out that form if i looked at that if i had an issue at work and i looked at that form i would be like forget it as a worker like i'm not i'm not doing that but I had the benefit of knowing uh, worker centers and, and being able to reach out to them and, and getting that help. And I think every worker should do that. So what is your elevator advice then to somebody, to a worker comes to you and says, hey, you know, I'm getting screwed. You know, what, what, it, what, it, what is, you know, what are the sorts of things you can say in that situation? Well, it really depends on what the violation is, but also organizing is always the answer. Worker power is always the answer. When you have people that have your back in your workplace, you can change things. And I know that, it, I know that you can because we've done it. Um, Marie Lena, I'm, I'm curious, people must call your office um, because you're a state center and because a lot of people know you from even before your time in the state center when they've got a problem at work or on the job. Um, what do you say? What is the short things that you say to people? What do you advise, you know, the low wage workers we're talking about that, you know, if something's happened to them, what do you, what do you tell them? Well, let me just say that I don't think it's the four page or six page um, um, f form that they have to fill out that would keep them from uh, standing up for their rights. What really is the problem in industry after industry after industry where there's abuse, where there's mass violations, is retaliation. It's, it's the uh, injecting the fear that you're gonna lose your job and you're gonna lose your job either, uh, and, and even worse, if you're undocumented or if you're an immigrant. Uh, those are the things that uh, stop workers from going and, and, uh, and fighting for their rights. Um, this, you know, this process that Sarah's going through, that we could get organizations on the ground and they work with the, with the people who uh, are in those jobs uh, to file the complaints, but that's not the biggest problem. And the industries know that. Entire industries rely on violations of workplace uh, rights. Entire industries the garment industry, the landscaping industry, the warehouse industry, uh, restaurant industry, their entire industries. And it's not because of the form that they, are, that they hold back. It's because they know that when they assert their rights, they're gonna be fired and or risk deportation and or risk a lot of other things. So they're gonna be worse off without organizing, without having a, a, an organization like the Warehouse Resource Center or a union, then there's even more prevalent uh, violations. I think there are 47 worker centers in the state that are supposed to bridge that gap, right? Um, we just had a piece in Zocalo this morning um, uh, published by a, a, a gentleman uh, originally from Guatemala who's a uh, uh, was a restaurant worker, um, victim of wage theft. You know, um, you know he he went to a worker center in San Francisco uh, where he works um, and got some help in the worker center in filing, uh, putting his his wage claim on the record um, in February 2022. It's now October 2023. Um, he's been told he'll get a hearing, but that's it. Doesn't have a date for it. So, I mean, do those worker centers bridge the gap? Maria, I mean, um, Daniel, I mean, what, what do they do? Yeah, so I mean, I would say the worker centers are incredibly important in bridging the gap. As Sarah mentioned, you know, and I can speak to my own experience as well. When we're the government agency, and based on my personal experience going out there, you know, we convey our sincerity. We try to make the connection with them, but it's always a little bit difficult because we're there for the first time. They've never seen us before, and it just, it's just kind of a confusing experience for the workers as well. They don't know if they can trust us, and in some situations, uh, they confuse us for immigration, or the employer tells us tells them that we're immigration as well, despite our best effort to kind of dispel them of that notion. And I think 
our greatest challenge has been always kind of building that worker trust. And worker centers are just so important in empowering workers, getting them to, I think, kind of understand their rights and just kind of helping bridge that gap which leads to effective enforcement as well. I think when our workers know their rights and they're willing to speak up, despite the fear of retaliation, worker centers enable that, and in turn, that makes for much more effective enforcement results. But isn't there, though, an issue where, like, it's important to have complaints to know where things are coming from, but the number of people in California, the number of complaints, the staffing issues in, in government agencies, um, and, you know, and unionization, you know, which it's gaining here in state, but still from a very low base. Doesn't, don't we need something different? I mean, chasing complaints isn't, you know, isn't fast and it's time consuming stuff. I mean, do we need different kind of approaches? I mean, sure, since Amazon is highly automated thing. Could there be an Amazon of labor enforcement? You know, I mean, companies use, companies use, um, um, you know, you know, all sorts of uh, surveillance and algorithms and hiring and other things. I mean, can the algorithms be turned and, and developed in favor of sort of trying to predict and show where the problems are so you can focus your limited enforcement resources there? Is anyone doing that? So I won't reveal all of our trade secrets in this conversation. Okay. <laughs> that being said, I think we are very much aware that, you know, we don't abide by a strict complaint-based model. And I think we are, I think, increasingly trying to be proactive in thinking about, you know, part of our model to enforcement is whatever enforcement we do, we're cognizant that we're working with limited resources and we want there to be a ripple effect and that we want this enforcement action to be more than that of the immediate employer. We want the word to get out to other employers in the industry, to other workers in the industry as well, and hopefully be able to have an impact that's beyond um, just that one case. And part of what we're doing is also doing research and looking to identify you know, what type of cases might fit within a category as well. And that's helped to start to inform our approach to investigations as well. Have you done anything well, like that? I, you know, one thing that we did in this last year's budget and this year, it started because of, of COVID uh, where, you know, the really violations were rampant, even worse. Um, where we um, included in our budget funding for workers, um, worker centers, organizations uh, to go out and inform the workers about what their rights were because of COVID. And so what we did was we, this last year, we extended that to add more money and saying that the organizations on the ground need to be funded so that they do outreach, hopefully you know, that outreach then leads to more workers connecting with each other and uh, building the kind of uh, collective uh, strength that they need. You can't just go out and um, accuse the employer of something because you know that there will be consequences to that. So when you have a backup, so we have uh, funding that went for the domestic workers to be able to reach out to domestic workers um, and keep, you know, keep the battle uh, on that front for health and safety on the job. So one thing that we did was to add funding to be able to do that kind of outreach and, uh, and organizing uh, with the workers. Interesting. What about the sort of question of partnerships? I mean, it was seven years ago, I think, when uh, Julie Su, who's now the US um, Labor Secretary, um, was, the, was your old boss. Actually, I can't, now I'm in trouble because I call Julie old, and she's younger than me, so she's definitely not old. And um, um, yes, exactly, from a long time ago. And she decided, you know, the State Labor Commissioner, which had this sort of notion of uh, neutrality before, you know, we're gonna get out there, we're gonna be more aggressive, and because we don't have all the resources we need, we're gonna partner with workers' rights groups and, all, and, and, and nonprofits and people who, who can speak the language, and we're gonna get out there and, and do that, and and then and that'll lead us to sort of our the bigger problems to larger employers or you know industries that particularly have a problem. D did that work? It does work. Like each each piece of this is a piece of the puzzle that helps the working class, right? So we have the complaint. 
we have the legislation, and then we have the worker power, right? And, and you put them all together, and it does change lives because it's changed my life, and it's changed the lives of my coworkers. They have safer working conditions. They get paid more money. It's not enough. We're still not there. It's still not a safe place to work. We're still not making enough money, but it's much better than it was. And it does work, and it can happen. And all of these pieces matter. Sir, I want to follow up that, that question to you. In, in, in the campaigning work you're doing with, with, with the, the organization Warehouse Workers, are you cooperating with nonprofits and with enforcement people from the state and federal governments? Do you see those kinds of partnerships happening? Are you experiencing those? Yes. Yes. They do, they do exist. <laughs> what is it like? I mean, is it? I, I mean, you were talking to each other constantly. Do you? No, do you, I, I you know? have not. I mean, I have. I, I don't even know if I can talk about. It. I don't think I can get into detail okay, about okay. that. However, yes, there are conversations do take place and things do happen. Okay. It's a little bit slower than, of course, right. a worker on the ground would like it to be, but uh, it, it's still happening. Right. How is those work? I mean, those are. I should note those are. A lot of these are the kinds of organizations, are, are the actual organizations that our, our friends at Irvine are uh, helping support. I mean, wh what have some of these partnerships worked? Is there a model example of one? Are there things that haven't worked well because the laws are strange, the people are limited in how much they collaborate? What's that picture like? Well, I can give you two examples where that collaboration included employers. So mm. in our Garment Worker Protections Act, we had uh, small business primarily women-owned businesses in the garment industry who came to Sacramento, who visited their legislators and said, we want, we're going to treat our employees, we are treating our employees good, paying them well, but we want you to do something about the rest of the industry. And they supported the legislation uh, to hold employers accountable. That was really powerful to legislators, and it made, a, it made a big difference. With our domestic workers, we have uh, household employers who came to testify from all over the state. So we have, uh, we have the ability to bring voices to the table and also to make it clear that in California, we will not tolerate uh, wage theft. We will not tolerate retaliation, but we have to have more more, I think, do more to help these organizations on the ground do their work, which is to reach out and help them, the workers, really, um, you know, be able to stand up for the rights that they have. And I'd agree with everything folks have mentioned. I would say that these partnerships have been highly effective. As we mentioned before, um, one of the greatest challenge when it comes to labor law investigations is wor getting workers' trust, right? Getting the trust of current and former workers. And by working together in partnership with worker centers, we were not only able to identify some of the most major violators which have been shaking up the industry, but also to be able to help build worker trust, you know, help build, uh, you know, worker uh, trust that, you know, that they'll be supported throughout this process against retaliation, that, you know, there's somebody who is willing to listen to them, who's willing to help you know, figure out the answer to all of these violations they're facing as well. And that's something that's been really paramount in us being able to move many of these cases forward. And some of our most significant enforcement actions have been through a direct result of this partnership. And one example I will provide is we recently had, or in a, over the course of several, a few years ago, we had an enforcement action against a janitorial subcontractor which had a lot of janitorial workers, which was working a lot of unpaid overtime, below minimum wage, not getting breaks, and they all worked for Cheesecake Factory locations. Mm -hmm. So now, under more conventional labor theory, we'd hold the subcontractor liable because they're direct employers, but the subcontractor um, did not have enough money to pay for all of these unpaid wages and penalties that these workers were owed. But because we were thinking strategically, we were looking to utilize all the tools that the legislature gave us and looking to see what type of impact that we can make to really help support the workers. We were able to attach the liability to Cheesecake Factory because they're a client employer. Because they decided to contract with this general contractor who broke the law. 
So Cheesecake Factory instead assumed the liability. And we have to let you know that you know, this was impactful, not just for the workers that we recover wages for, but also in terms of the industry as well, in that in the janitorial industry, it did make headlines, not just with the workers, although that's very important, but in the industry as well. We heard from many janitorial contractors that this was kind of the talk of the industry, that they were talking to their clients about the risk exposure and reassuring them that no, we don't break the law, we do everything correctly, we pay overtime, we pay minimum wage. And in fact, for some lawful employers, they said thank you to us, which was really a first. Most employers don't say thank you to us for really yeah. just kind of <laughs> enforcing the law. So we think it was very successful. We're, we're going to go to questions, but I want to get one question in before the audience. Have just a very practical question that I heard from people. Um, I hear from people a lot in, 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 in the advance of this, which is if, you're, if you, you, you're taking a job, it's not the best wage. Maybe you have, uh, these day and age, you might have choice between a couple different jobs, right? That since people are short of workers. And, and, and you're, when you go and look at you know, the, these jobs, are there signs, are there tells that people should look for and say, you know, this place, this, I see this thing and, and it's, or I hear this thing, and it, it means I have a good chance of being treated fairly, and also warning signs. Like, if you see this, this, you know, maybe stay away, you're not gonna be treated well there. So I say this with a caveat that this is not always the case, but two red flags that we've seen is if your employer pays you late and if the employer does not give you an accurate pay stub, those are red, red flags. How about you? Have you? What are the red flags you've seen? When, when you start a new job, there's a honeymoon phase, right? So your employer is going to tell you, hey, you can be a manager. Hey, you can make more money. Hey, this is going to be a good thing for you. And then you're there for a few months, and you're like, wait a minute. <laughs> uh, maybe some of these things are not true. And so it may start off with you thinking that it's a good place to be. But after being there for a while, it, it's not. Is, is, there, is, there a thing, is there a thing you advise at that moment, actually? At that moment, I, the, the gentleman wrote for us, the restaurant worker said his first year was pretty good. It was this pop-up restaurant. And then, you know, he started to get yelling at for no reason. It was like this, where the moment where it started to go south. Are there things you can do at the moment where it starts to go south that make a difference, you know, in protecting yourself? Organize. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Yeah. I would also add document in that if you start to see patterns, document that, write it down, write down when that happened, because that might be really useful to us later on in the investigation. Yeah. So uh, we just, uh, thank you to the governor, just signed a bill about UC uh, service workers. University and, of California, And the, yeah. uh, the unionized workers now have the right, could be the first time in the country, now have the right to file a complaint on behalf of workers contracted out non-union workers doing the same work if they don't get the same wages and benefits and everything else that the unionized worker has. So it's the first time that you, you they could actually have, while their conditions may be below what somebody else is, that union worker can file the complaint for them. And that's a really empowering thing to create unity in the workplace because that's what's the most important thing to that we need. Uh, okay. We have some questions from our online chat room. Meanwhile, if anyone here in the audience has a question, please come right up to me. Um, be prepared to say your name and uh, ask your question to the panelist. So we're gonna start with a question. Is there a sector of the California economy that sees more workplace complaints than other sectors? So it's difficult to name just one. There's several different industries that we typically call more low-wage industries where we see a lot of violations. They include, um, this is not all-inclusive, all but the restaurant industry, agriculture, warehouse, um, garments, um, janitorial, residential care facilities, and also uh, for certain violations, construction as well, to name a few. Thank you. The next question, uh, also online, uh, from our on, uh, online audience, and it's for Sarah. What has been the hardest part of your organizing experience? 
It was the retaliation. The retaliation is the hardest part because it, it not only uh, will they put you in unfavorable positions, but uh, uh, they, yeah, I can't talk about it too much, but yeah, it affects your uh, mental health when you're not allowed to express yourself or speak to other people in your workplace. So that is definitely the hardest part. Um, but also, it's, wor it's worth it. It's worth standing up. It's worth being that voice. It's also worth it. Um, a question for Senator uh, Dorato. Was there a particular person's story that inspired you to get into union organizing? Um, my story, my story of my family working in the fields, my story of our entire family as kids growing up, working in the fields, moving from town to town, um, seeing my parents work as hard as they can, and yet when they couldn't work anymore, had so little to be able to survive on, that was, every step was, was wrong, but every step was also good because we learned to back each other up as a family, and I think that's why I became a union organizer. <laughs> Um, there's a question, um, I, I believe it's for Daniel. What are options for people with disabilities to complain? So, um, just to make sure I don't miss, could, I, could you repeat the question one more time? Um, the question is, what are the options for people with disabilities to complain? <laughs> Got it. So, it would depend. The, it would depend on the nature of violations in that if you're being uh, retaliated against based on your disability, there's a couple of different agencies which will be able to assist you, including uh, California uh, Department of Civil Rights, um, EEOC to name a couple. But in terms of uh, if a person with disability wants to file a complaint for let's say wage theft as well as other issues, we have multiple different venues. Like a person does not need to physically come into our office to file a complaint. There's different options via both telephone as well as via online system that is accessible that would allow them to file the complaints as well. And we would of course engage with them if they let us know uh, so that we're able to accommodate um, their situation as well. Can I, can I ask one quick follow-up question because it comes up a lot in my travels around California. What if you're, you're in your work, you're an independent contractor? And you, and you don't get treated well. I mean, that's out of your jurisdiction, right? At the Labor Commission, Commissioner's Office, or am I wrong? What, what do you do then? Who do you complain to? So many Californians are independent contractors. So that's a very good question. And the first question I would ask is whether they're truly an independent contractor, because so many workers consider themselves to be independent contractors. But if you actually look at the California labor laws, it's pretty difficult to be an actual independent contractor in California. So the first thing I would say is probably give us a call, tell us about your situation, and we can help tell whether you're an employee or independent contractor or not. And if they're an employee, we can definitely help them. Thank you. <laughs> um, uh, this question, my gosh, I just lost it. Um, oh my goodness, I scrolled right by it. Oh yes, um, I, uh, this could be for anyone on the panel. Have there been particular cases of unfair treatment in the workplace that were particularly striking and memorable? I would say um, domestic worker stories when we had the whole series of fires and when domestic workers were being asked to either stay after the time that the household employer left asking them to stay and help take care of the house, or after, very closely to after the, the fires, to ask them to come in and clean up without the protections that they needed to then, um, uh, you know, clean. And so those personal stories were very impactful to me. Senator Durazo, can you uh, clarify what fires you're talking about? Um, the... Uh, the fires that we had, you know, uh, big wild the fires, big wildfires. Right. Yeah, I'm like sorry. The story the parts of Santa Rosa that, and Redding yeah. and Paradise and yeah. so many other communities. Yeah, that ha was there was a lot of that documented. Wow, <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> um, 
um, th that's it for our online questions. And now we can move into final comments, unless someone has a question in the audience. Yeah, I, 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 one question I wanted to ask. I mean, California has a lot of laws that are different than their places. And, and I'm curious about each, the three of you, um, because it gets, it gets argued about, and um, um, it's probably something I hear business people complain about a lot, and it may be part of a big fight on the ballot next year. It's, you know, it's our Private Attorney General's Act. It's um, been 20 years. I remember when Gray Davis signed it as he was leaving, or 20 years since the recall um, this fall. Um, where it means that workers can file class action lawsuits against their employers, alleging violations of state law, governing working conditions. Essentially, the, the private attorney can become like, an, a, like a state attorney, an attorney general. Does that, does that work? Is that something that many workers can really access? I mean, I'm, I'm curious about, have you ever encountered that? First, anyone ever suggested to you that this law? And, and you know, with the workers that you know, they've worked with have not been doing well? I mean, I've had a few ideas when it comes to some <laughs> class action stuff, but uh, that particularly, no, I didn't. I'm curious how Maria Elena and Daniel think about that, that law. I am so sorry, but this is actually one question I can't comment on because I help oversee part of our enforcement work with PAGA. Okay, so. okay, fair enough. Well, uh, I've seen it work. Uh -huh. I've seen it work because can you imagine the process? We just got a, a, a little bit of an idea of the process to go worker one yeah. by one by one. And when you have entire industries uh, and employers participating in illegal, illegally, uh, you know, um, not respecting the laws, uh, then uh, what you need is something that's much stronger. You need something that's stronger that says, I don't have to go through this worker by worker, it's clear, we have evidence that this is rampant in this workplace, then we should uh, be able to do the class, class uh, actions. It's the attorney out there hunting, though. You haven't seen the, the, the well, regular but if worker who gets if, together with a few. But if, they were, if there weren't these mass uh, prevalent yeah. violations, there's nothing to worry about. The, the problem is, like I said earlier, there are entire industries Entire industries, not one bad employer, not two bad employers, but entire industries. If we don't have a way to do this in a much uh, bigger way uh, to enforce the laws, then it's going to continue. Uh, and we have to have more, more tools and find, figure out different ways, more creative ways, uh, to show that we want this to stop in California. Okay. We are a great state stop with the violation of these labor laws. Okay. I think we'll try to end it there. It's time for us to close. Um, conversation can continue here in person and, and, and online and at ZocaloPublicSquare.com. Um, thank you for the, the audience for joining us tonight. It's a beautiful night and the weather's not too hot and not too steamy here in uh, Sacramento, which isn't always the case. Um, you'll find a summary of this talk um, at ZocaloPublicSquare.org. Um, by tomorrow, Zocalo, Z-O-C-A-L-O, -O, um, plus interviews with all our panelists um, in the green room. Um, please subscribe to Zocalo's newsletter, podcast, social media, and follow us on YouTube for more great conversations. This program is part of Zocalo series, What is a Good Job Now?, supported by the James Irvine Foundation. I hope you'll join us uh, for future programs as the series continues, I believe, next in L.A., with the question of what is a good job now for the formerly incarcerated. After that, we're gonna do Salinas and Ag. Um, Senator DeRazzo, Sarah, Daniel, thank you so much for joining us tonight for all the great information. Um, everyone, please give our guests another round of applause. Thank you, Joe.